Today, um, I want to talk about Bayesian inverse problems. So, you know, this is just a probabilistic formulation of, of uh, inverse problems. And uh, I will talk a little bit about the modeling, about learning, and then uh, finally also about uncertainty quantification. So, which basically means that we try to find out uh, whether we can give guarantees uh, how well uh, reconstructed images uh, can be with respect to unseen data. Um, what I present here today is joint work with Martin Zach and Dominic Nanhofer. Martin is a PhD student of mine, a very talented one. Dominic just finished his PhD and Andreas Habring is a PhD student of Martin Holler, who is a professor at the University of Graz in Mathematics. Okay, so let's start with something uh, I hope you have seen already many, many times. So we are talking about um, inverse problems and in inverse problems, you know, you always have to think forward. Uh, and this means designing a forward operator. And here this equation simply means that, uh, you know, we have an unknown image X, for example, or unknown signal X, there's some uh, operator involved. A could be a linear operator or non-linear operator. Then this operator can also perform subsampling or, or you know, cropping away some data. Uh, you have also noise, and this finally gives you your measurement set. And the inverse problem we all know is uh, knowing set, we want to reconstruct X. So uh, here in this talk, I will mainly talk about MRI, but you can also do computer tomography. Um, this is one of the very nice graphics Martin did. So this is the logo of Theo Graz, and he really computed you know, the Radon transform. I just need in my LaTeX code to change an angle and I get the real distribution <laughs> of densities on the line. And this could be uh, one of the data uh, for, for computer tomography, the scenogram. So if you don't have all angles or you know, if you have uh, compressed sensing, then you might mix, uh, miss some of the angles and then uh, you have missing data and the idea is to reconstruct from this scenogram then the, this image here on the left hand side. But the more uh, interesting application for, for medical imaging is, of course, MRI. We all know that in MRI, the data is not acquired in the image uh, domain, but it's acquired in the case space, which basically means uh, the Fourier domain. And um, yeah, the idea is then to reconstruct from the measurements in the Fourier domain the knee image on this side. And here we have a Fourier transform involved, but there can be you know, also some, some other uh, uh, maps involved like a downsampling or a, uh, a subsampling operator. Okay, so um, this is not an inverse problem. This is a, a well posed problem because if you have a fully sampled K space, then we just need to apply the inverse Fourier transform, and this is a very efficient algorithm. And uh, then we can uh, nicely reconstruct an image. But what happens if we start to subsample uh, the K space? And this is what, what's usually done in practice. So you take more measurements in the center, the low frequencies and then only a few measurements uh, on, on the high frequencies. This is so-called Cartesian subsampling. And if you then apply the inverse Fourier transform and just do a zero filling of the missing data, then you get this kind of image with backfolding artifacts. And therefore we somehow need to think about an approximate inverse, not directly inverting. Uh, in this case, F is equal to A, but we need to think about an approximate inverse. Here written with an A decker and one of the classical choices is the pseudo inverse. And what people are doing in practice is still, you know, um, applying the pseudo inverse or at least doing uh, an iterative reconstruction based on a uh, least squares error. So nowadays we've already heard that data driven approaches are have taken over actually. And what people are doing, they are trying to set up a training database of inputs, set and, and you know, ground roof images. And they try to learn an approximate inverse here, parameterized with some parameter vector theta. So how does this work? Um, let's start with an untrained uh, approximate inverse from, from our subsample data set. Then we get this reconstruction. And of course, we're not happy with it. So we try to minimize uh, the least squares error with respect to a ground roof. And then we uh, need a large training database. This is here uh, written with an expectation, expectation over the measurement set with corresponding X ground truth from our data distribution. And then we start to you know, minimize the loss function. Uh, and uh, hopefully we see now when you look here to this image that after training, uh, the approximate inverse has become better and, and the quadratic error with respect to the ground truth has decreased. And then we, we get a learned approximate inverse. So here are a few 
uh, popular examples of, of learned approximate inverses, you can do, for example, a simple post-processing with a big neural network. This is work of Zponta, in which is still one of the, the leaders of the leaderboard of the fast MRI dataset. Then there are these variation networks. Michael already uh, mentioned it. Kerstin Hamannik was a PhD student of mine, um, where we also learned the neural network, uh, which still uh, has some relations to classical variational approaches. Um, um, or you can do much more recent uh, algorithms like the Dudo Rnet, which is a huge neural network, and I think is one of the leaders at, at the leaderboards now. There's also this uh, so-called auto map uh, method, which is a method that completely ignores, you know, all the the forward operators that really takes uh, measurements and ground truth and tries to learn everything. While in this previous method, still, for example, the Fourier transform is used a part of the network because we know that the Fourier transform is important for MRI. So. Um, Short discussion, uh, data-driven approaches are the leading methods. So this has to be acknowledged on many benchmark data sets, including the fast MRI data set. I guess many of you know the fast MRI data set of NYU. Uh, but we also know that we simply need two main ingredients to make them work. This is data and compute. Um, one problem with neural networks is also well known that they are prone to overfit to the draining database. And uh, it's really hard to adapt those networks to <clears throat> new situations. And this we will see shortly in an example. Uh, this can be problematic in MRI, for example, if you uh, change the acquisition protocol, change the subsampling pattern, or have a different contrast. And this turns out, even for these well-trained, huge neural networks can lead to severe artifacts. So this is the UNET. Uh, of, of Sponta, which is a post-processing neural network. So it first makes an inverse Fourier transform, then applies the magnitude pixel-wise to it, and then this is fed forward to a, a UNET type of neural network. Uh, and then basically you can get these very nice reconstructions and comparing it with the ground truth, you see, I mean, there's some information that is lost. This is clear because we have less data, but uh, compared to the uh, zero filling reconstruction is greatly improved. So what now happens if we uh, make the life easier for the neural network, which means we don't use a subsampling, we take a fully sampled network, then suddenly uh, the, the neural network doesn't know how to deal with this nice situation where all the data is available. Normally it just would say, okay, I'm happy with the inverse of the Fourier transform, so I don't need to do anything. But unfortunately, uh, the PSNR decreases. And we see that it does an over-sharpening and over-accentuation of, of, of fine details in, in, in the result. Okay. Um, and therefore, we clearly need a more principled approach that allows us you know, to somehow partition uh, uh, image prior, for example, with a data fidelity term and make the, the network adapt to, to new situations. And also, uh, it's, it's very nice to, to model uh, uncertainties in the reconstruction. So this is uh, the, the second part of my talk when I talk about model uncertainties. So this more or less uh, cries for a probabilistic approach. And I'm, I'm citing here a, a colleague of mine at Theo Graz, who recently said to me, probability is halfway of AI. And, and I have the feeling he's right. And what is the, the, uh, the nice framework to, to deal with such problems with uncertainties and, and uh, is clearly the uh, statistical modeling and Bayesian inference. So this is the Bayesian theorem. I guess this is nothing new for you. So uh, we can define a posterior of, of the reconstructed image X given the data set as the likelihood set given X times the prior and normalized by the, by the evidence. This is the Bayesian theorem. We simply is a, is a, is a simple result of, of the sum and product rules of, of probabilities. So when you acknowledge probabilities, Bayesian theorem is just rearranging uh, you know, conditional probabilities based on the product rule and, and marginalization. For the likelihood, um, this is actually the nice thing here is that we can um, incorporate uh, the prior knowledge from physics, like the forward operator of our inverse problem. And we can also adapt to the expected noise in our data. So when we use, for example, this Gaussian distribution, then we are expecting somehow 
Gaussian noise in the K space, but we can also use something different, uh, exp some exponential distribution or Poisson distribution or whatever. And um, since it is hard to deal with probabilities because they are usually tiny numbers, uh, it's, it makes sense to apply the negative lock to the Bayesian um, theorem. And then uh, we get something of this form. So the negative log of the posterior is the negative log of the likelihood minus the negative log uh, plus the negative log of the prior plus some constant, which is the uh, the logarithm of, of the partition function. And this then this uh, makes it easier to uh, identify uh, classical variational approaches with uh, probabilities of the Bayesian inference. Namely, the data fidelity term is nothing else than the negative log likelihood, and the regularization term is nothing else than the negative log prior. So, what is the catch with a Bayesian formulation of, of inverse problems? So, while in classically variational models we are just looking for a minimizer, or at least for you know we try to relax energy, and and it's usually happy if you find a, a stationary point. But now the Bayesian theorem tells us that actually there's a whole distribution of possible reconstructions given our data, and uh, this allows us not to select a single one, but a whole distribution, or even to draw some statistics from the reconstructed images. So now we can consider different Bayesian estimators. The classical one, which is equivalent to minimizing the variation energy, is the maximum a posterior estimator. Uh, maximizing the posterior is equivalent to minimizing the energy. But uh, in recent years, uh, it seems that uh, sampling-based methods, for example, to compute the minimum mean squared error or posterior expectation, uh, uh, become more and more interesting because, you know, in a Bayesian sense, they are they are optimal because they minimize the uh, quadratic distance or quadratic error with respect to uh, to all possible uh, reconstructions weighted by the posterior, and they they uh, are shown to be more stable. So here I have a, a simple example showing the difference. What happens if I uh, take a noisy signal? I, I start to regularize it. So here you see that the black line mm -hmm. here is the, the noisy signal. And if I want to regularize it here with, with what is already mentioned, the total variation regularizer, which is just the absolute difference of, of, of signal uh, points here. Uh, and what happens when I do uh, sampling and then compute the minimum mean squared estimate? And here you clearly see that uh, with minimization, this awful staircasing uh, artifact arises, which was actually the reason why we started to think about the TGV regularizer originally, because this was able to re remove it. But when I simply move from minimization or for, from the map estimator to the MMSE estimator, then this leads to more natural uh, reconstructions. Of course, we cannot reconstruct those sharp discontinuities, but still discontinuities can be reconstructed. So you can think of that the MMSE estimator doesn't overfit to the model imposed by the energy is it? while minimizing or computing the map estimate overfits to your model. And if the model is wrong, it might not be a good idea. And, and usually all models are wrong, of course. And uh, what you also see in this black shaded um, background here behind the blue signal is uh, actually the posterior distribution for, for each point of the signal. So you can see you can easily compute the average, which is the MMSE estimator, but you can also compute variances. And the variances somehow tell you uncertainties. And usually, when you look here, the variances around these continuities are much higher compared to variances in, in more flat regions. And we will later come back to this issue. So here I have included an expert slide. So if you have some background in convex analysis, there's something I, I like very much which is a totally symmetric structure between minimization and, and computing the posterior expectation. So let's assume um, we have an, a linear operator, which is just identity. So that means that, and we have we use a least squares data fidelity term. So we, we, we are just in a setting of denoising. <clears throat> and just going back here, you see we are, we, are, we are about here. We have a regularized on the data fidelity term using identity here is just a least squares term. So uh, computing the map estimator amounts for minimizing this energy. And we all know this is nothing else than the definition of the proximal map with respect to tau times r. 
And um, when we express this function in terms of set, then this is nothing else than the so-called infimal convolution. And the convolution kernel here is nothing else than the quadratic function divided by tau. And now we know that uh, the gradient of the infimal convolution is just x minus the prox of x or z minus the prox of z. And putting this together immediately tells us that uh, we can compute the minimizer of this denoising problem by taking one gradient descent step on the infimal convolution. So it's just one gradient descent step. This is a result of computing a gradient of the infimal convolution in terms of, of the proximal operator, but it's, it's, it's a standard result well known. And the formulation of the infimal convolution of the regularizer is usually written in this with this small square here. So this basically means you take the energy of the regularizer, you put the quadratic kernel everywhere, and then you take the envelope function below it. And the gradient of it can be used based on the prox operator, and then you show that the unique minimizing case, R is convex, can be commuted in this way. Now let's compare this to the, to the sampling uh, case. In the sampling case, uh, we are interested in computing the posterior expectation. So you see, we are waiting over all possible x times mm -hmm. uh, the exponential of minus the regularizer minus uh, the uh, data fidelity term, which basically means exponential of minus uh, the regularizer times the, the Gaussian, right? And the MMSE estimator is nothing less than the expectation in this way. So now it turns out that this can also be written in the form of one gradient descent step, namely using a formula which is known as Tweedy's formula, or it's also called empirical base estimate. It's, it's a very old idea you can find in very old papers. And for this, we define simply the uh, soft mean convolution, which I call it here. So uh, we, this, what we have here is nothing else than a convolution with a quadratic kernel or with a exponential of quadratic kernel. And uh, the negative in the negative log domain, we can define then this uh, regularizer, which is the soft mean convolution. So real convolution uh, of your prior with the, Gauss, uh, with the noise model. And is, if you look here, what is the log sum x? So log and the convolution has an integral, so I call it log sum x function. It's a soft min or soft max function. In this case, it's a soft min function because we have two minus here. And then it turns out that the MMSE estimator can be written down as taking one gradient descent step, now not on the infimal convolution, but on the soft min convolution. And this is exactly the Tweedis formula. And you see, it's one gradient descent step here for MMSE, and it's one gradient descent here for a map estimate. So there's some striking symmetry, which, which I like a lot. And basically, the Tweedis formula is used a lot, for example, for the recent diffusion models to learn the score function and, and everything that is involved. So um, in inverse problems, it turns out, I think this is also what Sebastian is, is researching now, the holy grail for us is, uh, learning the prior distribution, trying to find good models, good structures, uh, which are good to learn, easy to use in different inverse problems. This is the holy grail for us. And of course, you can ask yourself, what can you do if you have a good knowledge of the prior distribution? And well, a lot, of course, uh, you can solve inverse problems then uh, in different ways. So just let me mention there are a few traditional approaches. We have heard about it today already the total variation that has been used as a handcrafted regularization term. Uh, then there was the time of compressed sensing and sparsity, uh, for example, sparsity uh, based on the L1 norm in a wave flat, curve flat, shear flat domain, and so on. Then when we look back to the literature of learned approach, there's one paper which I also like a lot, the so-called frame paper of Manford Wu and, uh, sorry, there's, there's a typo of Zhu Wu and Manford uh, and frame uh, means filters, random fields, and maximum entropy. And uh, actually, it turns out that maximum entropy is, is a very universal concept. Everything, I would, <laughs> I would say everything in the world follows the principle of maximum entropy. For example, if you ever wonder why um, we are looking into priors of this form, exponential of minus some energy, actually they uh, arise very naturally by trying to find a distribution that fits to some constraints on their marginals, but have the highest entropy, the maximum entropy. An easy example is the Gaussian distribution. When you just fix the variance, 
the Gaussian distribution is that distribution with the maximum entropy. So it's not that the negative log eats away the exponential of minus and we are in optimization happy that we can easily minimize it. It really follows the principle of maximum entropy. And this has already been uh, developed quite nicely in this in this paper. Of course, at this time, they didn't have the strong computers and, and some other details were missing, but a lot that is used now is already in this paper, even when you uh, see what in recent diffusion based models is is, is going on. M many of those ideas are already in this paper by Ma Zu, Wu and Manfred. Then another model, uh, for example, Pakshal, you, I guess you know it very well, the fields of experts model is one of the first, you know, learned um, models that uh, was successfully applied uh, to image processing. And when we look at the, the more recent state of the art, uh, all the, the image bias are based on neural networks. Um, there are, for example, variational autoencoders, generative adversarial networks or diffusion models. But I'm not so sure how, how well they can be used for as priors in inverse problems. They are more designed for efficient sampling. So you just want uh, to learn how to get an example from, from a distribution that is similar to your data distribution. But I'm not so sure how, how well they really work uh, as priors. But we are still in the course of, of exploring this. For example, looking at the evidence lower bound, which is a lower bound to the log uh, prior and so on. Um, but uh, what I will show you now, and this is the work of, of Martin, that actually we can define a parameters prior based on neural networks. And this is exactly this Gibbs distribution. And the structure, as I said, is motivated by maximum entropy. It's exponential of minus some energy that takes as input the image and has also some learnable parameters phi. And here, this term is just for normalization because we want that it integrates to one. So that kind of neural network we are using here is nothing very particular. Uh, it's just a cascade of, of, you know, this is a cropping operator in MRI, this is important. Then you have some layers S1 up to SL, then there's a fully connected layer and then we apply the absolute function in the end. And every layer is written as a concatenation of, of a of a ReLU or leaky ReLU, non-linearity, a linear operator, again, a leaky ReLU linear operator, and we also have some biases here. So here this symbol here is a leaky ReLU and, and you see it's max of gamma X and X and gamma is a number usually close to zero. So the learnable parameters are W, W, L tilde, W, L, uh, BL tilt and BL, just biases and, and linear terms. And in the in the higher levels, those Ws are usually convolutional uh, layers, and, and then later they are become co uh, fully connected ones. Okay, so how can we learn or how can we fit a prior in this form to our data? And the oldest idea is maximum likelihood. So what you try, you and you again do this in the negative log domain. You try to minimize the expectation uh, of X sampled from a reference distribution of the negative log of, of your prior here. And then if you write this down explicitly, you see uh, you minimize uh, the expectation um, of X of your energy here, uh, plus the log of this integral of exponential minus error. And this basically comes out from the uh, log or negative log of, of this uh, normalization functions. It's the, the log evidence, basically. And this also easily shows you that this is, in principle, intractable, because this integral is an integral over all possible images. And even for four times four images, uh, I think it's 10 to the 20 or 10 to the 30 different images you can generate. So this really explodes, and you cannot handle this in general. Still. You can try, and this uh, the first time has been done by Hinton, to compute the gradient, because we need the gradient for learning of this objective here with respect to the parameters phi. And what comes out is a very nice structure. First, you get here the gradients uh, of uh, the regularized applied to your training data. And then you get this awful term here on the right-hand side. But you can identify that this is nothing else than the prior distribution. So it means it's the expected gradients under your current model. And you can uh, easily write it down like this way. And this is then uh, in the form of so-called contrastive learning. What you do is you want that your energy is low on your data, on your given data. 
But at the other hand, you have a, a minus in front of your gradient. You want that the energy is high on examples X sampled under your current distribution. So for learning what you need, you need uh, to compute gradients on your data, which is usually easy. You just take the, the images you have in your data. But here we need to sample those X minus examples from our current model. And this is, of course, a, a heavy problem. And usually what you do, you, you take uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods and the methods that currently work best are methods based on the unadjusted Langevin algorithm. Of course, you can make the metropolis adjusted, but uh, usually in practice, this is enough what you do. What is a uh, Langevin algorithm doing? So uh, assume this is some trajectory X in your space of images. Uh, you make a hill climbing. Yeah, so you go upwards towards the mode, scaled by epsilon over two. So you make a gradient ascent on the log distribution. But at the same time, uh, you jump away a little bit by injecting some noise. So you make a step towards the mode, but you jump away a little bit. So it's like a stochastic gradient algorithm that always try to reach the mountain, the summit of the mountain, but always gets you know uh, a little bit noise so that it moves a little bit away. To make this work in practice, you need to know a lot of tricks. I have to say, and Martin had a hard task doing all this, but finally he found a way where you can do very nice uh, learning. And here are some examples of when we learned, uh, you know, a prior of, of knee MRIs on the fast MRI data set. And uh, what this figure shows you is that uh, what happens if I start with a noise image and I just do gradient descent on my learned prior. And uh, basically you see that this always converges to a invented knee. It's a knee that has not been in the training database, so it's a generated uh, knee. Uh, but you know, comparing this with GANs and diffusion based models, we really know how the prior behind it looks like. So it's great in descent of the, of the negative log prior. And here we see a projection into a 2D space, how the energy, I mean, it's, it's here, it's an energy decrease, finding the mode uh, of the log prior, but you can also view this energy minimization of the negative log prior. So this is a video playing. So this is approximately how it looks like when you, when you sample a prior, and you have just a gradient method that basically converges towards uh, an artificial knee that has been learned from a training database. So now we can uh, perform uh, our inverse problems and compare it with the state of the art. Um, and uh, basically what we see is that uh, our method, which then just applies a gradient descent algorithm on the energy formulation, or it applies sampling. So we have both MAP or MMSE because we have, we have all the posterior we can do based in inference in, in many different ways. And it turns out that we are approximately as good as, as those best neural networks, maybe slightly better on some examples and slightly worse on other examples. And uh, I have to mention that the UNET was uh, trained exactly with the sampling pattern. So it was trained that the input data comes with the sampling pattern. What happens if you change the sampling pattern? And now this is where uh, we really see that the Bayesian formulation of the inverse problem makes sense. The UNET uh, completely uh, goes down in PSNR while our result basically stays the same. So it's not so much influenced. The only thing you have to make sure is that uh, the sampling factor here is approximately uh, the same as previous so uh, that you can achieve the same PSNR. There's another sampling with those spokes. The UNET uh, gets worse and we just stay at the same performance. And basically you can do this for many different sampling patterns. A very hard sampling pattern is just a random sampling pattern. Where for example, the zero field distribution, you know, it, it misses some low frequencies. So it, it looks very bad. Also the unit uh, looks very bad and still we can get some reasonable reconstruction here. I also want to show uh, a more advanced application. So this is something that is clinically relevant. Uh, it's parallel MRI, and the difference of the parallel MRI to the easy per MRI I've just shown is that you have several receiver coils, and you have case-based data from several receiver coils, but at the same time, uh, all the receiver coils have different spatially varying sensitivities, which I call sigma C here. And basically, it means our forward operator has to be changed uh, before we apply the Fourier transform, and also the sampling pattern, we need to weight the image by means of the corresponding sensitivities of the receiver coils. So here X is weighted by sigma one, and then you apply the, the Fourier transform 
and so on and so on and so on. You have much more data, but uh, now it becomes a nonlinear inverse problem because we need to uh, estimate both the sensitivities as well as the reconstructed image X. And you easily see that this comes along with an ambiguity, namely, I can multiply X with an arbitrary field point base and divide sigma with the same field. So, and it doesn't change uh, the out outcome of, of this forward operator. So therefore this means we need two priors, one prior for the uh, image as we have already learned, but there is another prior for the sensitivity maps. Fortunately, the sensitivity maps are, uh, you know, quite smooth spatially. And what we uh, do in, in, in this work here is we, we don't learn a prior here, we use a handcrafted prior, and this is just the H1 norm. And for the H1 norm, you can compute the proximal map, for example, in closed form using the uh, fast discrete cosine transform. In the algorithm, we then uh, make uh, use of uh, alternating linearized minimization. So we use this IPARM algorithm. Here we have the, the, the input data uh, from the different receiver coils in the case space. First, we make an initialization with a zero field solution, and then we make a gradient descent step on the prior to improve the image, make a gradient descent step on the, uh, or a proximal map in this case, on the sensitivities. And uh, after approximately 40 iterations, you get quite a good result. We used exactly the same prior that has been learned before for this reconstruction. We just added these, uh, you know, sensitivities in the data fidelity term, and then in the inference, we also needed to account for that. Here's a uh, comparison similar to the previous. Uh, here with total variation reconstruction, which has the usual blocky problems, the staircasing problems. This is the variation network, one of our own works, which is a little bit better here. Uh, but as soon as we change again the sampling pattern, we just rotate it, same amount or almost same amount of data, then uh, the networks that have been overfit to the sampling pattern get worse uh, while this doesn't affect this formulation. Uh, <clears throat> same if you uh, change the, this uh, acceleration factor, uh, same if you use this spoke like. Uh, sampling pattern, or if, if, if you use this, you know, Gaussian blob-like sampling pattern. So you see this number stays almost the same, not affected by the imaging protocol. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about uncertainty estimation. So basically what you can do if you have a sampling algorithm, you can compute the average, which is you know the, the mean squared estimate or the posterior expectation, but you can also compute pixel-wise variances. So you can see how much does every pixel change over the sampling, and uh, can compute in an online fashion the variance pixel-wise. And this is usually what is called uncertainty estimation in inverse problems or in in, in different fields. Uh, you look at the posterior and, and you want to measure what's the variance of the posterior. Here it's just a pixel-wise posterior where you take the variances. Of course, in general, you have covariances. But what is really interesting in practice is how good is the reconstruction? What is the error? And uh, in this work, uh, which is the work with Dominic, uh, Andreas, and, and Martin, uh, we tried to explore what's the, the common information, what's the mutual information between posterior variance and error with respect to an unknown ground truth. So let me start with a toy example and 1D example to explain the idea. So what you see here, this is the prior, it's a 1D prior. Okay, you see the result minus one or the, the, the value minus one is quite likely, the value zero is quite likely and the value one is quite likely. And there are some, it's like a Gaussian mixture model around them, right? So for example, a uh, value uh, minus 0 0.5 is uh, very unlikely. So this is the prior. We assume here for this toy example, it is given. Then we have a noise model. And here we use a, a standard Gaussian noise assumption. And um, what you basically need to do, you, uh, you generate your noisy data by convolving uh, your prior with the Gaussian kernel. So this is how it is then computed. And this gives you this P of set here, okay? So when you convolve P of X with a Gaussian kernel of some variance, which is the noise, 
then you get the p of z this is the distribution of your noisy data you could call it prior of your noisy data and how does this distribution look in the common space in the joint space between x and z you get these 2d gaussians here so here the inverse problem is completely determined now you can ask what happens if i see a noisy measurement of zero you just take the posterior distribution so say conditional distribution of x given z equals to zero you cut here and you draw this orange curve and this is what you get this is the how the posterior looks like and then you can take the value that has the highest probability in this case it's zero but you can also take the average or the, the, the median whatever you want Here it's quite easy we see it gives us back the right probably the right solution because uh, this is this this mode here but what happens if you see uh, a measurement of 0 0.5 or in this case I think it's 0 0.55 uh, then you need to cut here and then basically the posterior is bimodal and now it becomes more interesting because first of all when I took the map I get this solution when I take the expectation I get something here in between but luckily what I see is that the variance here is quite large the variance is you know how much does the uh, the signal vary uh, around the mean we get a high variance and when we look here the variance is very narrow and so this basically means we are quite certain that this gave us the right solution but we're not certain that we have the right solution here what you see here on the right hand side is um, a graph showing how does the expectation depend on the noise measurement and we see first it is minus one then it becomes zero when when we see a zero here and then it becomes one uh, when uh, when we see a one here and basically when when we have seen at a noise measurement a zero we just need to cut here we get zero as a result and if you have seen a 0 0.55 which was this value here the expectation is then nothing else than 0 0.63 okay and when we look at the variances we basically see that the one example with uh set equal to zero has a very low variance and the one with uh, 0 0.55 has a very high variance okay so now the, the complete idea of this work is that what we do is we can make a change of variables where we transform the joint distribution of x and z of real reconstructions and noisy measurements into another density that depends on the error and the variance no matter how large the dimension of x and z is s and t is always 2d because you know the variances are uh, just numbers and uh, the errors are just numbers so for exactly for this example when we now check for every every um reconstruction what is the variance we get a pair of numbers here pair of numbers here and if you draw the corresponding distribution it looks like this so this for example means uh, uh, for errors one minus 1.7 so i think it's in the log domain we have seen those variances for an error minus 0 0.6 we have seen those variances okay so it's it's a joint distribution between errors and variances in the reconstruction and what you can then do is you can just compute the cumulative distribution along the arrow direction and then you can start to work with quantiles so when you just integrate up from here up you get this cumulative distribution on the right hand side and for example if i draw the 0 0.9 quantile i can say that if i've seen a variance of minus uh, 1.964 in 90 percent the error was below minus 2.147. I can draw a, a 0 0.95 quantile and, and it go up as much as I want. Okay. In other words, you can say, okay, if I see a certain variance, I'm sure that 90% of the pixel have a, a smaller error than this. So this is the basic idea. And this, uh, of course, we apply them to images, not just to these toy examples. So there's one problem uh, computing the density. P of S and T in, in practice is intractable. 
here we were able to do this, uh, you know, by explicit formulas because everything was explicit here. Still, we need to, you know, compute strange curves in this space, but it, it, we managed to do this explicitly. But in, in practice, for real inverse problems, it's not possible. So therefore, what we need to do is we need to rely, uh, first of all, on a finite data set and also on sampling algorithms. So this basically means we can only compute a few samples here on the left hand side, not a complete distribution, but you know, just a sample approximation, empirical approximation of this distribution. And also when we compute the cumulative distribution, we of course have just the empirical cumulative distribution on the right hand side then. So still we can ask um, the question, can we derive theoretical guarantees from those empirical distributions? And the question is yes. And uh, actually this is based on the on a lemma of Romano, Petersen and Candes of 2019. And it's called the inflation of quantiles. So it's just the, the formal statement. Assume you have uh, N plus one IID random variables and ID is really important that everything works. Then you pick a quantile between zero and one. And then basically, you know that if I take a quantile, an empirical quantile, and I make it slightly larger, so I multiply this number Q I've selected times the factor one plus one over N, then we get a slightly larger quantile, then the probability that this last example here is less equal than this empirical quantile is greater equal than Q. So this basically means uh, that uh, the more examples I have, exactly with this factor, the more certain uh, you know this quantile approaches this quantile here. Um, but uh, and on the other hand, it also tells us that uh, you know we, we can explicitly compute the probability of of this example being inside this quantile. So now what we do, we, we apply this inflation of quantiles lemma to the random variable SI, which are the errors, conditioned on the random variables T, which are the posterior variances. So the, the error depends on you know, the measurements, capital letters means random variables, and ground truth reconstructions. And the variances only depend on the uh, measurements, of course, because you know, they are based on the, on the posterior. And uh, in practice, um, what we do is we partition the space of variances into some intervals here, as you can see here, and we do this separately for all the different intervals. And what you see here in this, in this graph here is that, that the dash gray line indicates the exact conditional 0 0.9 quantile for this previous example. And uh, the red line indicates the inflated quantile, so the quantile made a little bit larger. And basically you see is that instead of uh, predicting a certain error, the error is slightly increased. And the increasement, of course, changes with the number of samples I have in this interval for the respective variances. So with this, we uh, can give the following theoretical guarantee. Uh, we have our random variables, X, I, and Z, I, Z, I, which are you know, the uh, measurements and the images. And uh, the error is computed just in a least squares way and the variances are computed uh, based on the posterior. We also need to make sure that the, the errors are bounded from above uh, and that those intervals uh, have samples so they are not empty. Otherwise we cannot do any quantiles if we don't have data for a certain interval. And then it turns out that uh, the probability that the error in a certain interval uh, is less equal this inflated quantile or the probability that the error is smaller than this inflated quantile is greater equal than Q. And this is exactly this inflated quantile based on the formula of uh, uh, Romano and co-workers. What we see is um, that the guarantee depends on the number of samples and tau k falling in the respective intervals. This clearly influences the results. So uh, this sounds too, too good to be true. Uh, there's still one catch. Uh, namely, um, this only holds on probability. So this is only true <laughs> if you, you know, randomize over many different data sets, you do the computation on a finite data set, which you have sampled from your, from your full data set and so on. And on probability of all this, this is true. 
But still in practice, it turns out that it gives quite, quite reasonable results. So although it's only true on probability, you can make very easy examples to show that this does not hold for a simple uh, single experiment, but still in practice, it works quite well. There's another catch that in order to satisfy the IID assumption, we can only predict the error of one pixel in an image. This is still somewhat a philosophical question we have not fully answered. For example, we can do it for a single pixel and do everything with a single pixel, but then you can ask yourself, what's the difference of this pixel and this pixel? So why does one result not hold for the other result? But it's not, it's not so easy to think about it and we still haven't arrived at the complete conclusion about it. So in practice, you can uh, you, you know, take all the pixel variances of all pixels in your image and, and do it jointly. But in order to satisfy the assumptions of, of the previous proposition, you really can do it only for one pixel. Again, uh, the theoretical guarantee only holds in probability. So no strict guarantee can be given when you just apply it for one image. If you apply this for infinitely many image, on average, this will be true. But for one image instance, this is not true in general, although in practice, it, it works quite well. But there's a good side of it. Uh, actually, the effect that we computed the estimator based on an MMSE or we used the conditioning on the variance is completely arbitrary. We have just seen that the variance, you know, it's an it's a average quadratic error nicely fits to the quadratic error with, with respect to the ground truth. But you can even learn a neural network that, that gives you a prediction and you can apply the same method also for a neural network that conditions on the error. So now let's say, let's make finally an experiment um, with uh, a few different priors for image denoising. We also have uh, examples on MRI reconstruction, but which I didn't put here. You can find it in the paper. One is the total variation. One is the fields of experts prior. And the other one is a so-called total deep variation prior, which is uh, a, a prior that is based on a, on a neural network. So here we, we see the, the joint distribution of errors and variances uh, in image reconstruction on the whole database. Then you make the cumulative distribution and then you can draw the 0 0.9 quantile, which, which looks like this. So basically, when you look at the posterior variances, you might find a certain value. You go here and you see, aha, in 90%, the error is smaller like this. This is for the TV prior. This is for the fields of experts prior. You see that the better the prior, the better usually the quantiles. And this is the TDV prior. Here we see a result for the uh, TV prior. So this is the true error. Uh, of the reconstructed image. And this is the estimated error. In some cases, the true error can be larger, but it's only the 0 0.9 quantile, so only 90% we know that the error is smaller than the, the true error. This is for the fields of experts prior. Now we see that the estimated error becomes more blurry because the regularizer has you know, a bigger field of view. And this is how it looks like for the total deviation regularizer. Finally, some quantitative results. Um, first of all, we see that the better the prior, the better the denoised images, the reconstruction increases. Um, we uh, evaluated different quantiles, and then we really checked how well is the quantile predicted. And we see that those numbers are really very close to the asked quantile. So the coverage in general is, is, is quite well by this method. What is also interesting, and this is still not fully uh, explored, and we also might use this for learning, is we, we also computed the mutual information between variances and errors. And it seems the better the prior, the higher the mutual information between the variance of your posterior and, and, and the prior. So this is quite interesting and encouraging. For example, you might uh, try to learn a prior that maximizes the mutual information between posterior variance and, and, and error. So this brings me already to conclusion. So I hope I motivated uh, Bayesian formulations of inverse problems because they are much more versatile. You can adapt to different uh, protocols in the imaging formulation, for example, different sampling patterns. Still, it leads to state-of-the-art results. This needs some engineering. So it's not the first shot uh, outperforms the state-of-the-art of neural networks, but if you work a little bit, you can get as good results, uh, but it's much more flexible 
uh, and uh, you can uh, compute the mean squared error, you can change the data fidelity term and so on. I also just talked about a method for, for predicting the mean squared error based on the posterior variance. Uh, there is some theoretical guarantee which is slightly violated in practice, but which uh, still gives you quite reasonable results. And I, I think it, it, it's nice to know in practice how well the method performs. The prediction method is universal in the sense that it doesn't make any assumptions about the involved distributions and prediction functions. Thank you very much.